Jim, you said that the risk premium has gone in the stock market and that we're seeing a relentless inflow into stocks, into ETFs, in large part because the Federal Reserve is uh, supporting the market. But you've also said that the one thing that could really upset the apple cart, so to speak, is persistent inflation. How do you uh, see that potentially unfolding? Yeah, so a couple of things here. Um, the risk premium gone because if you measure the market by most of the traditional metrics, and even some of the non-traditional metrics, it's at least fully valued, if not overvalued. If anybody's looking for a cheap place to buy, uh, you're not going to find it in financial markets because they're all fully valued. So what's driving them is this relentless flow of money into markets. We, this was probably most highlighted by the big rally we had in the spring, right after the American CARES Act sent out $1,400 uh, checks, over 100 million of them. The inflows into, into ETFs, mutual funds, and even options trading hit all-time records in the few weeks right after that as well, too. So that's what drives this market, is this idea that money stimulus will just continue to flow into it. So what ends it if the money or the stimulus stops? And what could end the stimulus is a belief that inflation is something more than transitory. As long as inflation is transitory, we can look past it. We could say it's going to go away by itself. We could still talk about whether or not Washington will continue to spend um, huge sums of money in the form of stimulus, and the Federal Reserve will continue to buy bonds at least at $120 billion a month and maybe stall off the potential tapering, slowing of that bond purchase. But if you get persistent inflation, then the urgency to end the stimulus goes faster. And then when you have that urgency to end that stimulus, then you have risk that that relentless inflow into the markets could end or at least slow down, and then you can run into trouble. Now, the Fed's preferred inflation metric is PCE, personal uh, consumption expenditures, uh, as you know, and that's around a 30-year high. And you've got the 10-year, as we speak, around 1.3%, uh, the, the yield there. You said that the, the Fed is holding rates down, and you, you mentioned that just there. You also refer to what you call DGT, Demographics, Globalization, and Technology. Now, we have an in-house economist, and he argues that we're seeing a, a reverse of these decades of, of globalization, we're seeing that reverse to a degree. Would you agree with that, especially in China? Yeah, I think DGT is, is demographics, the aging population. When you get older, you, you consume less. You consume the most when you're like in your early 30s and you buy a house and you have kids. But when you become grandparents, you don't consume as much. So the aging demographics depresses uh, inflation. Technology, the Amazon effect, depresses inflation. Globalization. You can pr produce something anywhere on the, in the world where it's cheapest depresses inflation. And I agree that of those three, the one that seems to be reversing the most is globalization. You've got the China uh, situation where the trade tensions between us and China are probably worse now than they ever were during the Trump administration. And you've got the Chinese economy slowing quite a bit as well, too. So of all of those that could potentially reverse and maybe put an end to this relentless downward push on disinflation, it would be the globalization part of it. Now, you've argued that the 10-year yield could get to at least 2.5%. We saw several months ago it got near 1.8, then it got down to 1.1 or so. So is this just sort of a lull where we are right now and that investors uh, who believe that we're going to see higher rates and higher yields, that they, they just need to be patient and let it play out? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that the... the Rates, let, let's just put this in a little bit of perspective. Rates peaked at 1.8% in March. And then that you're right, as you mentioned, in July, they fell to 1.12. And now they're above 130. And I think so. I think that, that that decline in rates is over and we're in the process of moving back higher. Uh, and that's even in the face of what are some signs of not only China slowing, as we just mentioned, but the US economy slowing, not recession slowing, but definitely coming off the boil a little bit. And so those creeping up rates, I think, are more a sign that people are starting to think about the idea of persistent inflation. I think that's going to become a bigger story later this year, if not into early next year, the idea that inflation is more persistent. And then you could see rates really start to move up. And again, I can't emphasize enough, that puts the Fed in a bind. If you have, inflate, if you have interest rates moving higher and you have the perception of persistent inflation and a call for the Fed to do something, 
That do something is to tighten. That do something is to buy less bonds. And that won't sit well with the stock market. Then they're in a very bad place should we get there. Jim, you've said that uh, right now we're seeing uh, supply chain constraints, which, of course, have been triggered by the pandemic. They're probably worse than ever globally right now. So do they just inevitably work themselves out or could these supply chain problems linger? Because in large part, COVID lingers as well for a lot longer than people think. There's an old saying that the cure for higher prices is high prices. Uh, and so, if, yes, eventually the supply chain will work itself out. It, but I do think, though, that if you're saying, OK, great, it's going to work itself out, that could be another year or two that it could be working itself out. I vividly remember in March and April and May, we were talking about supply chain problems. We said, yeah, this is going to peak in a couple of weeks. Well, here we are nearly in October, and it's worse now than it was in the spring. And it's especially showing up in the automobile sector uh, as well, too. Production of cars is down. Companies like Toyota are already announcing all of next year's production is going to be slashed. The prices of cars are soaring. The average price of a car, according to Edmonds, in August is now over of a new car is $43,500. That is up over 10% in the last year, and it's rising at a 30% pace over the last three months or so. So car prices are soaring because production is down. And if you're expecting that somehow we're going to fix this semiconductor problem or the supply chain problem to get car production back, yes, it will eventually get fixed, but it might not be to the end of next year. So this is going to continue to linger a lot longer than people think. Now, let's focus on the stock market, Jim. You've said that uh, people in a mania, investors in a mania, can make money quickly and make a lot of money very quickly. But the key is to know when to get out. So how, do you, how does an investor do that? Keep dancing and stay invested while also looking for signs of a turn in the market. Very tricky to do, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost impossible to do. But what, what I was trying to say with that comment was, and this gets back to the valuation comment, if you look at the stock market and you say the valuations aren't good, the economy's uh, outlook is very murky, you would have exited the market in the spring of last year and you would have never returned and it's doubled. Uh, because if you're waiting for that perfect situation of cheap valuation and a proper and a bright outlook, it comes around every once in a while, but not that much. So the idea is you want to stay involved with the markets until there's a clear and unmistakable sign that things are starting to turn. Now, I don't think we have that right now. I think we might get that in the next year or so. And I think that that sign would be, at least in this cycle, higher interest rates. And I think that that would be a real problem. But the bigger point here is, oh, the market's overvalued and, oh, things are looking a little bit iffy and I don't want to be invested in the market. Well, that's going to be 80% of your life is, is, the way you're, is the way that market is always going to be. And that's what I meant by you got to stay involved. If it is, you know, you can make a lot of money real fast if the market's going up and you'll give some of it back on the other side, but it's better than just sitting out the whole game from the get-go. Now, you've talked about uh, it being a new era for retail investors. Uh, they have more uh, access to information than ever before. They can have access to zero commissions and fractional shares and so on. But what about the, the opposite argument? that This is just the usual dumb money coming in at the end of a bull market and a, a mania, if you want to argue that, and that they're going to get burned. Or is that too simplistic to look at it that way? No, it's not. I mean, I get that argument, and that argument has been true in the past, but I do think that there's two things that have changed, at least in the short term, the last year or so. Again, if the government keeps mailing everybody money, they're going to put it in savings. In, in 2021, savings is the S&P ETF, is what it is. It's no longer putting your money in a zero interest rate bank account. So the more stimulus we continue to get, the more the market continues to move higher. And I think the other thing that's happening with the market as well, too, is that more people are starting to understand the market. And let, let, let's be honest with you. You could be a, a professional investor working for a billion dollar plus money management firm, or you can be an individual investor on Reddit and uh, looking at Yahoo Finance. And the, the information gap between those two is the narrowest it's ever been. That retail investor has nearly the same tools, nearly the same information that that uh, professional investor has as well too. 
uh, you know, they may not have the time to invest in it. That's a different issue, but the tools are available to them. And so therefore, I, I think it would be a little bit um, incorrect to just say, well, it's all dumb money coming into the market. It is a it is a transformational flow in the way that we see the markets, that people are getting more involved with it. Robinhood is not going to go away. And the idea that people are going to chase meme stocks is not going to go away. It may ebb, it may flow, the meme stocks may change, but it is going to be a permanent part of the way that investing works. Jim, let's shift to crypto and blockchain because I know that's an area you've done a lot of work in. And you've compared the current situation to the internet in say the mid nineties when everybody was trying to figure it out. Nobody knew who the long-term winners were. Uh, and so when you look at say Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, uh, Polkadot, they all have blockchain networks. So uh, can we say at this point, or is it too early to say that they're gonna be, let's say the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, or could they wind up being the Alta Vistas and the Netscapes? Yeah, that's that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. I think we've got it right that we're looking at a lot of these smart contract blockchains, like the Ethereum's and the Solanas and the Cardanos and the Polkadots, as the place that we could basically think that um, that's where the future of decentralized finance and maybe even the financial system is coming. But it's really hard to say whether or not they are, as you said, the the Lycos and the Alta Vistas, and that was a reference to. In the late 90s, if the, the story I like to use is in the late 90s, if you came to the conclusion that internet search and internet retailing is going to be the next big thing, you were 100% right. And in the late 90s, if you then said, okay, the biggest internet retailer is pets.com and the biggest search engine is Alta Vista, so I'm going to invest all my money in that, you would have been 100% wrong because right. they both went out of business. Yeah. And so that's going to be the trick with decentralized finance. Is it going to be this gigantic transformational thing? Absolutely, it's going to be. Is the financial system going to look very different in 15 years than it does now? Absolutely, it will be. Will it be Solana, Cardano, Ethereum, Polkadot? Or will it be something that is not has not been created yet? That's the tough question to really ask. And that's really hard to get your head around. Remember, Pets.com was a big advertiser in the 1999 Super Bowl. And so therefore, it had to be a, a legitimate company. It was advertising in the Super Bowl. Within two years, it was out of business. So, you know, yeah, you could say, but, uh, but Solana and Cardano and Ethereum, they, they have to be legitimate given their size. They could very well be. Or there could be something that has yet to be created that could come along and supplant all of them. We'll just have to watch and see. A very good point, a good analogy. And lastly, Jim, uh, you've said that uh, investing comes down to winning more than you, you lose. And you've made a baseball analogy of a guy can make the Hall of Fame failing seven out of 10 times because he batted 300. So uh, you've had successes, you've had failures. What have you learned from your failures in terms of uh, not being too rigid, uh, i.e. being uh, rigidly bullish or rigidly bearish and just playing with uh, and investing in a way that the, the market is, is giving it to you? Well, the first one I, I've learned is kind of something I hinted at a minute ago. You got to stay in the game. You, you know, you've, you've got to stay in the game and you got to believe in the game. And you got to remember that when you invest in an index or you invest in companies, you're investing in entities that can remake themselves. So if the situation turns bad or the economy turns south, these companies can remake themselves into something completely different. Uh, you know, look no further than Apple. Look at what Apple was doing 20 years ago. Look at what Apple was doing 10 years ago. Look at what Apple's doing now. And the answer is that they don't even sell the products that they had 20 years ago. They don't even sell the products they have 10 years ago uh, as well. So they do remake themselves all of the time. So the first thing I've learned is you definitely got to, you, you've, you've definitely got to stay in the game and you got to play the game. The second thing I think I've learned uh, as well, too, is that this explosion of information, whether it's social media or it's the ability to have internet search to find out information on companies, is democratizing in investing more than it ever has. I think that this time now, I've been in the market since the late 80s, and this is the time now where everybody's got the fairest shot than they've ever had. I can remember back into the early 80s, late 80s, early 90s, when there was just a group of, let, for lack of a better word, let's call them privileged investors that knew things that no one else knew just because they had the resources to find that out. Well, 
that game is gone now. Everybody's got the resources. Like I said, you might not have the time, but uh, so you've got a chance if you want to play in this game as well, too. The information's there. The resources are there. The ability to play, just you've got to play. You cannot convince yourself that I got to sit this one out and sit it out all the time. Like I said before, there was a very credible case to make in the spring of 2020 that you got to sit this out, that the things are going to get very bad. And the stock market doubled in the fastest double it had in 70 years. So that's why I think you've got to definitely, you know, learn to continue to play in this game.